Hello, and thank you for watching uh, my video. The video you're watching is just a very short introduction to the Roman poet Ovid, and my name again is Professor Ryan Paul from Texas A&M University, Kingsville. So just an overview, some of the basic topics I'm going to talk about in this, again, very short lecture. Um, the cultural and historical contexts of Ovid, um, the life, work, and style of Ovid, or at least his major work, Metamorphoses. And throughout that, I'll be talking about some of the differences um, that differentiate Ovid from Hesiod and Homer, who we've also read this semester. So first, let's talk about the geographical and political context and how different that was. Um, Hesiod and Homer are both living in ancient Greece. Uh, this is a relatively small area. The governments that, that they're living under, these are small, independent city-states. These are not large nations or empires. Um, there's frequent conflicts between them. And so Hesiod and Homer are really familiar with a rather small area, and they're really talking about figures and characters from a rather small area. Ovid, on the other hand, um, is living uh, about 800 years later at the height of the Roman Empire, which is a centralized government that rules um, Asia, Europe, and Africa, or parts of it. So this is a much larger geographical and political world that Ovid is living in. And um, it, the Roman Empire is undergoing constant expansion into new areas, and it's a much more cosmopolitan, wealthy, and sophisticated world um, by our standards compared to the rather parochial and small world, although highly educated, of ancient Greece. So just to give you a sense of scale, here we have um, Greece, ancient Greece, and the important Greek city-states, Sparta, Athens, Thebes, Corinth, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, off to the west of the uh, Peloponnesus there is Ithaca, where Odysseus lives. And this is just Greece, um, uh, and, and we see part of Turkey, what is modern-day Turkey. So they are talking about a very small area, relatively speaking. And even though Odysseus himself is supposedly travels all around the world, um, what Homer knew and what Homer really was familiar with was, again, this very small area. On the other hand, this is the Roman Empire under um, the rule of Augustus, who is the emperor during Ovid's life. Um, so we see it covers a much, much larger area. And again, it's not that Ovid um, knew personally all these places or went to them, but they were much more real to him. They were real places where his government had extended their authority as opposed to these semi-mythic places on the ends of the earth that no one really had, had, uh, had ever been to. So he was aware of a much, much larger world. And so just another map, I've superimposed the Greek map over the Roman map. So you can see in that little circle is the world of Hesiod and Homer, whereas this much larger world is the world of Ovid. So again, just to get a sense of scale, the, the cultures that they're dealing with, the range of experience that they have, what the world looks like to them or what the world means to these authors and their readers is very different um, for Homer and Hesiod than it is from Ovid. Roman culture. Now, while Greek culture was very learned, of course, um, in Homer and Hesiod's time, it was just starting to become literate. Um, whereas Roman culture in Ovid's time, as again, which is almost a thousand years later, um, is a highly literate, sophisticated, and cosmopolitan culture. Uh, Rome itself has people from all over the Roman Empire living there, many different languages, art, goods, uh, travelers from all over the world. So it's a much more um, worldly sort of place in a certain sense. Um, also, their culture um, was, especially at the time of Ovid, was a very uh, loose, what we might say, morally speaking. Divorce and adultery were common and accepted, especially among the noble classes. Um, they very much enjoyed sexual humor and stories. Uh, they were not a prudish or uh, they were a religious culture, but not a highly prudish um, culture. They very much um, accepted and celebrated the, the joys of, of the flesh um, and considered themselves to be, again, very sophisticated and above the simple uh, su superstitions of the conquered peoples that the Roman Empire has, had extended its control over. The central political figure to consider is Augustus Caesar, Caesar, who was uh, born Octavian and was, uh, I believe, the nephew and later adopted son of Julius Caesar, who you will know as the uh, man who instated the empire of Rome. 
Um, and in 30 BCE, uh, Augustus became the emperor of Rome. He became the undisputed um, chief executive, we might say, of the vast Roman Empire. And his reign was marked by what's called Pax Romana, or the Roman peace, uh, the era in which Rome itself was stable and, again, at peace um, and flourishing. So, again, the centerpiece of this Pax Romana is the flourishing stability, the art, the peacefulness, the um, uh, high quality of life at the center of the empire in Rome itself and other um, important cities. Uh, but at the same time, there were constant wars of expansion going on at the borders of the Roman Empire. So Augustus was always trying to expand his realm. And it's partially that um, expansion and the... Uh, uh, exploitation of resources and labor at the margins in newly colonized areas that contributed to the empire's stability um, uh, the, of the central regions. And Augustus himself um, had an early life as a libertine. He enjoyed his pleasures, um, was himself divorced and had mistresses and so forth. Um, but when he became an emperor, he was very much interested in turning back the clock and reinstating traditional Roman family values, which um, he believed and some believed, uh, or at least said, were crucial to the solidity and stability of the Roman Empire. So he introduced a number of uh, legislative items when he became emperor that were meant to reassert traditional values in terms of putting limitations on divorce and so forth. And um, that is perhaps what brought him into conflict with Ovid later in life. And that will be our transition into talking about Ovid himself, um, that eventually his career as a poet would bring him into conflict with the emperor. Now we can talk about Ovid himself. And what you will be most pleased to discover is that here we have a real life that we can talk about. Um, as compared to Hesiod and Homer, who are almost mythological figures themselves, we have no facts almost about their life. There's in fact very little even known about their culture, the worlds in which they wrote. We only have knowledge about them from a couple hundred years after their deaths. Whereas for Ovid, definitely a fairly well-known historical figure. We have many facts and documents and connections to major historical figures. And he's from a much more familiar culture and time, a period that we just know a lot more about. So he can be a lot more definite um, for the most part when we talk about Ovid. So Ovid was born to the closest that we can date it, March 20th in the year 43, BCE, so 13 years before uh, Augustus became emperor. But we have an actual date here. Now, it might not be exactly right, it might not be the exact date, but um, we've been able to, to figure out something pretty close to a date. So this is quite remarkable when we compare it to Homer, who we don't even know if Homer was a real person. Um, and he was born in a small town called Sulmo, which was east of Rome, and he was born to a rather respected and established um, uh, aristocratic family. And he took his education in Rome. He was educated in rhetoric there, which meant he studied logic, he studied oratory, uh, that is public speaking, he studied law, um, and he also studied and had a great love of Greek literature and philosophy. So here is someone we can see again. We have a definite, you know, actual history of family that we can identify for this man. Um, and we know his education and we know that it would have been rather extensive. And so that also tells us that he is literate. He is writing. Ovid's writing down metamorphoses. All his poems were written uh, rather than coming from an oral tradition. So his um, education was meant to uh, lead him to a career in law and the Roman government, um, and he did have a minor career for a while as an official uh, in the Roman government, but he did not like it and he abandoned it to become a poet. Um, and this was something that apparently his father did not like. Um, and he enjoyed great success as a poet. Um, uh, of, uh, many of his verses were erotic. Um, he wrote a lot of po love poetry, um, as well as, of course, the Metamorphoses and some other uh, prominent poetry on Roman religious festivals. 
Um, and But some of his most famous and scandalous poems, besides the Metamorphoses, were ones where he celebrated his own erotic exploits and then he, and advised others on seduction. And I'll talk uh, briefly about those in a slide or two. And in terms of his poetic career, he was a contemporary of Virgil and Horace, who are two of the other sort of pillars of Roman poetry, uh, particularly Virgil, who wrote the epic poem, The Aeneid, which celebrates the founding of Rome from the survivors of Troy. Um, and so one of the things that we notice, this would be, if we had more time, we'd go into it. If we actually read the Aeneid, we could compare. But um, Ovid often conscientiously differentiates himself from Virgil, who was, again, uh, setting out to make himself the epic poet of the Roman Empire. That was not Ovid's interest as a poet. And um, in the, again, if we read the Aeneid, we could compare, for example, those sections of uh, the Metamorphosis, where Ovid talks about Aeneas to the sections of um, the Aeneid, uh, where, well, Aeneas is the main character. So Ovid differentiates himself and saw himself not as at all as the poet of the Roman Empire, this political, historical poet, as Virgil did, but much more as a uh, poet of, of art, beauty, uh, love, eroticism, and pleasure and passion and those sorts of things. As, as you heard me mention before, Ovid came into conflict with the Emperor Augustus in his career. And uh, it is uh, what happened was in the year 8 CE, um, Augustus exiled Ovid for the rest of his life to the frontier city of Tomis. Um, and uh, so for the rest of his life, Ovid was banned from Rome, living in this, what he considered to be a very uh, horrible city um, on the frontiers of Roman Empire, where most people didn't even speak Latin, which for him as a literate Roman citizen would have, you know, been going to someplace and no one spoke his language. They all were barbarians to him. Um, and it was also a very dangerous place because of the wars of expansion and conflict. And Ovid wrote uh, from there, continued to write, wrote of his sadness living on these frontiers, and eventually died in the year 17 CE. So just to give you a sense of where um, he went, we see here, again, the Roman Empire. Um, he was exiled from Rome there at the center of the empire, all the way out to that red star. That's where Thomas was. Um, and that was where he lived for the last nine years of his life. Uh, so it was quite a distance from the center of things. And again, on the um, frontiers, the wild frontiers of the Roman Empire. So the mystery is, why was Ovid exiled? Um, the exact cause is, is unknown. Ovid wrote that it was due to what he called a poem and a mistake. Um, perhaps people have theorized this was his earlier erotic poetry that had been written some years before that Augustus decided finally that he didn't like anymore um, and wanted to exile Ovid for that. Um, some theorize that it was involvement in a personal indiscretion of someone close to Augustus, perhaps his uh, niece. Um, there are some scholars who even theorize that it never actually happened given the sparse evidence that we actually have um, that perhaps Ovid didn't really leave, uh, but he would just sort of wrote this elaborate literary conceit, took on this persona of an exile as a literary experiment um, to sort of express what it was like not being any more um, in with the centers of power. So it's, it's a mystery, a great mystery. We'll probably never know. Um, but given all things considered, we still know a great deal more about Ovid than we do about the others. So to talk about his works, he had many, many popular works, including the Amores, or the Loves. This was a series of erotic elegies about his on-again, off-again relationship with his mistress, Corina, who may or may not have been a real person. This may have just been elaborate, again, literary conceit. Um, a few years later, he wrote the Ars Amatoria, which is the art of love. He taught in which is, again, uh, erotic poetry, teaching the arts of seduction and love to both men and women. And he also wrote uh, or began a, a, an epic cycle called the Fasti or the Festivals, 
This was a series of unfinished poems on the months of the Roman calendar, on the religious festivals and myths, etc. So it was a really another, similar to the Metamorphosis, this great epic um, uh, sort of combining synthesis of multiple uh, religious and mythological ideas, but all under the idea of the Roman cal calendar. So these were just some of the popular works that Ovid was known for. His most famous work, of course, is the Metamorphoses, um, and it's his most ambitious and prized work. Um, it was the work that Ovid believed would make him eternally famous. This was his, his magnum opus. Um, so that right there also tells you something very different. Homer and Hesiod are not writing, or if they were writing, they were not uh, composing these poems necessarily for their own everlasting fame, although popularity and contests were, were part of it. But... Um, they were writing, you know, they were part of a, a tradition. Ovid is a author. He is a solitary author who, although he's writing within a tradition, is also writing for his own glory, his own literary fame. Um, so that's a very, just a difference in terms of the purpose, the overall point of, uh, and the context within which these texts were composed. And the Metamorphoses covers about 250 different myths throughout its 15 books. So it covers a whole bunch of different stories from many different sources, all again synthesized into Ovid's unique um, whole. The narrative of the poem covers all of history from creation to the present day, that is to the, the present day of Rome uh, from Ovid's time and the deification of Emperor Augustus. Um, so it goes from creation, and we see a lot of similarities perhaps to what we read in Hesiod, uh, although um, some noted differences as well. Um, and mostly his sources, again, are Romanized versions of Greek myths. So they're Greek stories, but they've been transformed um, in various ways. The characters given different names or locations, some details changed. Again, remember, even in Homer and Hesiod, we did not see uniformity between the different stories. Every area uh, in ancient Greece had their own sort of tradition, and Rome adopted um, all these different traditions. And again, what Ovid is doing, much like Hesiod, is trying to synthesize different stories that don't necessarily agree with each other, that don't necessarily go together, but trying to synthesize them into one coherent text. And here's just a little basic cheat sheet for most of the Greek and Roman names of the different gods and, and other characters, the Greek names on the left, the Roman names on the right. Sometimes um, Ovid will use both. Sometimes he'll use uh, the Greek name and the Roman name. Um, but for many, like Jove, Jupiter, he pretty much always calls him Jove or Jupiter, never uses the word Zeus. But uh, Athena might be sometimes referred to as Athena or Minerva. Um, Diana might be sometimes referred to as Artemis um, and so forth. So these are the, just to keep it straight in your mind, because it can get confusing, here are some of the most important names. Um, they're Greek and Roman names, so you can identify the comparisons between Ovid and what Hesiod and Homer write. One thing we might notice about the narrative is that in the early books, the transformations are usually the um, cause and result of the divine figures, the gods. It's their actions, their desires that cause all the transformations. But as we notice, as we move later on, after around, say, book six or so, um, the later books, the transformations while they're enacted by the gods, their causes are human passion, the extremes of human passion. And that clues us in that really, you know, while metamorphosis is the narrative theme, the narrative trend um, in this stories, uh, it's passion that is the deeper issue that really unites them and the extremes of passion. We also note that later in the books, um, later in the poem, he overlaps with parts of Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. He tells parts of those stories. He also overlaps with Virgil's Aeneid, which was, again, the Latin epic that celebrated the founding of Rome by the survivors of Troy, where Aeneas, the last survivor of Priam's family, uh, the royal family of Troy, escapes and, and eventually founds Rome. So here, um, again, and if we read Virgil's Aeneid, we could compare the way um, Ovid presents Aeneas, much less sympathetic, much less celebratory, uh, much less heroic than Virgil's portrayal of Aeneas. In terms of the style, the Metamorphoses is full of, a, a, again, very diverse and seemingly disconnected narratives. These stories 
um, really have very little to do with each other, most of them. Um, so what's the genius of it is not the stories, because again, Ovid's taking these stories from, you know, these are well-known stories, although he might be wreaking his own changes on them. But what his genius is, is the way he links them, the, in all the creative different ways of linking stories to stories. They are connected by shared geography, shared characters, maybe narrators. Some are embedded with the others. They might be on a similar topic or image. Um, so there's all sorts of really creative ways that Ovid uh, is able to link these different stories together and build connections that otherwise we wouldn't be able to put these 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 texts together. He's able to make us see ideas and links between them that we otherwise wouldn't have noticed. Um, and again, he has the uses the technique of embedded narratives, where he has stories within stories within stories and multiple shifting narrators in different perspectives. So he's able to not only give us um, you know, the entire story of the creation of the world to the present day, he's able to show it to us through all these different perspectives, all these different visions of the world. So we get to see these transformations um, and our own perspective on those, on what we see is transforming with the narrators. And so some of the explicit themes, which again are, are fairly obvious, um, and fairly clearly stated the explicit narrative theme of transformation. That is what links uh, pretty much all of these stories together is that they all deal with some sort of transformation. Um, but there is a deeper conceptual continuity. And that is, again, the extremes of passion, love, desire, hatred, um, lust, uh, all these sorts of desires, uh, despair, all these emotions. We see the, the extremes. We see them in their most... Uh, violent, vehement forms, and we see what that does to human behavior, human nature. So we see how humans are subject to um, our own transformations, our own internal metamorphoses. And there's also some political context. Um, and, and so some of scholars have questioned what exactly Ovid's attitude towards Augustus is. There are times when he seems to be very flattering, but there are other times when his flattery seems somewhat tongue in cheek to be almost you know, overly excessive. So um, are there moments when Ovid is subtly maybe critiquing or mocking Augustus's pretensions to divinity um, and imperial power? So the last thing to consider is the purpose of the metamorphosis, what Ovid is doing with this. And while he shares some of his purpose with Homer and Hesiod, uh, his different context and life makes, a, of course, the purpose behind metamorphosis very different. Um, again, Ovid himself was um, wanted to live the life of a poet. He wanted to make a name for himself as a poet. So part of this was his attempt to become immortal, to make his fame as a poet. So he was fulfilling his own poetic expression. Um, certainly a large part of this was entertainment and pleasure, the beauty of the language, the beauty of the stories, the humor, the, um, the entertainment, uh, perhaps the tragedy um, and emotions spurred by reading and these stories. Uh, but also, this is definitely sort of philosophical and artistic consideration of the human experience, of human passions. Uh, these stories are not meant to be taken literally, definitely not by Ovid. Um, whether or not he believed them to be true, I think probably he believes them to be myths, that is, stories. Uh, but even though he doesn't believe them to have actually happened, they are important for the way they encourage us to think about what it means to be human and the way we experience our passions and our relationships with each other and our life in the world. And finally, um, I would say that the divine figures, building on that, the divine figures are not so much gods, although the Romans did worship these, they did uh, have cults uh, to, towards these various gods. They were really more like allegories or philosophical concepts or embodied uh, forces rather than physical real beings that, that were believed to, to exist um, in some cases, at least in many cases. So this is not a religious text as much as it is, again, an artistic and philosophical text. Um, so that's very important to keep in mind when differentiating it between, say, the metamorphosis and something like the Bible. So just to review, um, the context of the Roman Empire in which Ovid lived was a literate, sophisticated, worldly empire. So a much larger world than Homer and Hesiod's. 
Uh, and Roman culture was very sexually permissive um, and not as focused on martial values as, as uh, uh, Homer's and Hesiod's was. Um, but uh, there was at the same time a movement to restore traditional values. Ovid himself was a highly educated and literate author who was very popular, and his works shared many common themes, um, including passion and desire that, that run throughout most of his works, especially the Metamorphosis. And the Metamorphosis is his magnum opus, his greatest work um, that, that has both been considered by history and by himself to be the work that, that made Ovid who he was. So last things for you to do, um, there'll be one last video posted, just my final thoughts on what we've read for the last few weeks. Uh, make sure you review the assigned readings from the Metamorphoses, those selected stories that I emailed you. Uh, the final quiz on those stories and the reading journal will be due on Wednesday, August 9th at midnight. And the final paper is due Thursday, August 10th at midnight. If you have any questions or concerns, please get in touch with me via phone, email, text, or Blackboard. And otherwise, good luck with your work this week.